Hello, everybody, and welcome back to TarHillIllustrated.com, or if you're watching on our YouTube channel, Tar Heel Illustrated. I'm THI staff writer Jacob Turner, and joining me, as he always does, THI publisher Andrew Jones. And Andrew, we're here for the third episode of our Top 25 UNC Football Players of All Time series. If you guys don't know, we've already ran two videos previously. Make sure you go check those out and head on over to our website, Tar Heel Illustrated. Dot com where you can find articles on each of these guys. It goes a little bit more in-depth on their stats and their careers at North Carolina. So just click the description below, and you will find a link in there to do that. And while you're over there, make sure you sign up for our premium message board, just eight thirty three dollars a month. It's a great time to do it in the offseason. we got a ton of recruiting stuff that goes in there. I mean, a majority of our recruiting stuff doesn't make the front page anyway and goes strictly on our boards. So if you want to get that kind of information and also some other tidbits and other stuff that's going on within the Carolina football basketball program as well, you got to be signed up for for our premium subscription. So head on over to our website after you are done with this video and take advantage of that. Like I said, just 833 a month, AJ. But let's dive into this one, man. We're here to discuss numbers 13 through eight on the list that you've put together. Um, We're going to start here with Paul Severin at number 13, um, played in back in 1938 uh, to 1940 at Carolina, actually played on both sides of the ball for the Tar Heels, two-time first-team All-American and two-time first-team All-Southern Conference. I mean, we've had a couple guys on the list already that played, you know, back in the 30s, uh, 40s and whatnot. I mean, long time ago, obviously really hard to find a lot of photos, a lot of info, a lot of highlights on them. But from what you've seen from from the accolades, what you've researched on them, I mean, Big time player for the Tar Heels back in the late 30s, early 40s. Yeah, and when people do lists like this, they have carte blanche to do them any way that they want. Sometimes, often, uh, people will do lists saying from 1950 on or from mm-hmm. 1970 on, or they just ignore the players from a long time ago, just assuming, well, those guys aren't as good as the guys today, mm-hmm. which maybe that's the case if you were to take Paul Severn from 39 as is and drop him into 2000 and into 2021 in Carolina's football practice, maybe that guy wouldn't be able to get the job done. But if Paul Severin were a young dude now training now the way that guys do instead of back then, then perhaps he would be one of those players. So I think it's important to capture the entire history of the program. And a guy that was a two-time first team All-American and 39 or 40 like Paul Severin, that matters. You know, college, one of the things I love about college sports in North Carolina, I epitomize this more than any school, is the layering of history. When you walk into the Dean Dome and you look, I mean, you look up at the banners, that's a layering of history. They got a 1924 Helms Foundation banner up there for a reason. Mm -hmm. Even though the Helms Foundation handed out national championships like candy back in the day, and a lot of them weren't determined until years after those teams actually played. The point is, the history kind of makes you who you are. And Paul Severin is a part of Carolina history. And I think it's important, like with George Barclay, with Paul Severin, that we we included guys like that in this list because they were legendary players. They did do, they were among the first to do things on a national scale. And uh, so you can't eliminate that part of the history just by ignoring it. It's still there. So He actually was very, very good. He had five touchdown receptions, I believe, his junior year, 1939, at a time when guys weren't exactly throwing the ball downfield. It was still a running game. So he gave an element to what Carolina was doing that a lot of other players didn't do. Mm -hmm. Uh, So he made them a more well-rounded football team. They had some very good teams during those years. And really, football in this area was pretty big. Duke was excellent back in that time period. Mm -hmm. So college football was bigger than college basketball for a while in this area. And it was in part because of guys like Paul Severn and the kind of teams the Tar Heels had during those years. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. It's a long time ago. I'm glad you, you can't just like push it away because you know, you can't ignore it. No, you can't ignore it. It's history. There's, there's accolades, there's stats to back it up. And when you actually sit down and read about these guys, you, you realize just how good they were and just how dominant they were in their era, which needs to be respected and needs to be honored. So, yeah, I, I totally get why you, you've thrown him on the list where you have now. Moving on to number 12, Sam Howe. This is the only guy on the list that is actively playing for the Tar Heels right now, which I remember when I saw his name, I was a bit surprised. But when you actually go look at his accolades, and obviously we've been able to cover him over the past few years, so I wasn't but so much surprised. But 
it's really backed up. Obviously, a quarterback from the Tar Heels came here as a freshman in 2019. Uh, this upcoming year, as Max said many times, is more, more than likely going to be his last season as a Tar Heel. I'm, I'm sure many of us are expecting him to go to the NFL after his junior season. But just look at the accolades he's already racked up. Two-time All-ACC, ACC Rookie of the Year, ACC Offensive Rookie of the Year. That was back in 2019. USA Today, Freshman All-American, Military Bowl MVP, uh, Manning Award finalist uh, in 2020. So, I mean, for a guy that's really only played two seasons at Carolina – it's about as good as it gets and about as much as you can do in the time that he's been here. And I think when you look at the guys on this list and you look at what he's done so far, I mean, I think it's, there's, it's a no burner. You got to put him in here somewhere. I mean, I don't, I don't blame you at all for doing that. I didn't seek opinions about all of these picks. I have over the course of time bounced it off some people. And I, and I did send this list to you and to Dina, John Gwaltney, Kevin Roy, just to look at it. Hey, if you guys see anything that's egregious, what, just let me know. We'll, we'll hash it out. The one thing that, that we had some debate over was what to do with Saban because he's a current player. And and I'm of the belief that there, there is a, a contingent out there that looks at current greatness and overrates it. Mm-hmm. It says, oh, that guy's the greatest of all time because he's in front of you and you can see him. And you know his game better than someone from 30 years ago that you're saying he's better than. Recently. Then there's the flip side to that, where people romanticize what, what happened when they were younger, and they still see it through the lens they did when they were younger. And they tend to think that nobody today could ever be as good as someone 30 years ago who was a superstar when I was young and, and really falling in love with the sport or this program or whatever, whatever the case may be for somebody. So for Sam being a current player and only two years in the books, what do you do with him? Well, a couple of people on staff said, don't rank them at all. Just don't rank anybody current. And then a couple of people said, well, how can you not? Because he is one of the 25 best players in program history. Mm-hmm. And, and he's the greatest quarterback in program history. Oh, yeah, so no you've got to put him somewhere. So this made some sense. And it's very likely that if we do this series again next year, that I believe it's possible Sam could climb, climb as high as number two. I don't know that anybody will ever pass number one on this list. Yeah. And he's kind of like Babe Ruth. Like Babe Ruth will always be the greatest baseball player of all time, period. No one will ever pass him by for the next thousand years that the sport is played. I'm not sure that Chuchu has that kind of grasp of the number one spot in North Carolina, but he's got a pretty firm one. So Sam is here. It's a good place for him because two years in, he's already at number 12. He's had some really, really good players. And he should have the kind of season that will launch him above most of the guys that are in front of him right now. He's that good. I think Carolina fans should appreciate what you have in Sam Howe. Quarterbacks were never really a thing in Chapel Hill. With a few rare exceptions, Jason Stanisic running the option the way he did. Mark May was probably the best passer the program had had up until the 2000s. But beginning with Darian Durant, when UNC started chucking around a lot more, and then you go from there, T.J. Yates and Bryn Renner and, and, and Marquise Williams, Mitch Trubisky, and now Sam Howe. They've had some really good quarterbacks in the 2000s, and I believe Sam is the best of that group and will prove that even more so this coming fall. Agreed, yeah. I think Sam's it's, – it's cool to cover him too like we have because, you know, like you said, and I think people should appreciate what you're seeing in him. Sometimes it's – you know, you kind of take advantage of him because you're watching him right now. But as good as he's been, I mean – I had no doubt in my mind, and we've talked about this off camera a little bit, that he's the, the best – he's definitely the best Carolina quarterback bar none that I've ever seen. And I thought Mr. Trubisky in his one year at Carolina was fantastic with the way he tossed the ball around. But compared to Sam Allen and what he's accomplished so far, I mean, there's just no comparison to me. He's the, the greatest quarterback to ever play at Carolina, and he's not even done yet. So going to be fun to see how he continues to develop going into his junior season, which, as I said, will more than likely be his last one as a Tar Heel. So, yeah, uh, 100%. He's got it. Even He's Max, gone. even Max uh, said that about ten times already. So yeah, no surprises there. Um, moving on to number eleven, Mike Voigt, running back at Carolina from nineteen seventy three to nineteen seventy six. Second team All American, two time ACC Player of the Year, two time first team All ACC. Uh, finished eighth for the Heisman in seventy six. And you're going to start hearing this a lot more often over the next couple of videos. But named to the fifty year fifty greatest ACC players ever team which like I said you're gonna start hearing that a lot more with a lot of these players coming up going into the top 10 especially so yeah I mean big time running back back in the mid 70s Carolina there's a lot of running backs on this list and we'll have a few more coming as well but 
I mean, look at it, man. Carolina's had some great running backs in there in the, in the history. And, and, and Mike's definitely another example of that. Well, he's one of the best. Yep. And, uh, you know, if, if we were to do a list of the great characters in Carolina football history, he very well could be number one. Hmm. Space Cowboy. The, the guys, the people, yeah, who are that watching, nickname. <laughs> the people who are watching this now, and I know a few of them that played with him, um, some, some really, really nice people, some guys with great stories. They will sit down and chew your ear off for hours about Mike Voigt's stories. So uh, he was an incredible player, three times ran for a thousand yards. The Duke game when he ran 47 times for 261 yards, scored the game when he touched down, when he just wheeled the team to victory. I mean, that's 1970s football, man. Give the dude the ball, block straight ahead, maybe a little bit of cross blocking, uh, may, maybe a pulling guard here and there, and just ram that thing forward and beat someone to death in front of you. That was Carolina with Mike Boyd. And really, that was Carolina football in the 70s. They had so many thousand-yard rushers. Yeah. The, the, the Bill Dooley – uh, three yards in a cloud of dust. Mike Voigt was perfect for that, but he often got a lot more than three yards and dragged people with him. When when people think about Javante Williams running over people, Mike Voigt used to do that on a regular basis. Uh, he had a, he played in the NFL for a while, uh, but of course this is about their college accolades, and he was fantastic. He was two-time ACC Player of the Year. Um, just uh, a, a guy that that when I heard stories about great ACC football players when I was really young. The first sentence included Mike Voigt's name. And I think people may, some people may have thought he was better than he really was just because they appreciate the way he played. And that's okay. I like guys that are gritty. I like guys that will chew glass when they're going through the line of scrimmage with the ball and hold on to the ball and carry that thing into the end zone. And Mike Voigt did that a lot. A fantastic player that uh, I actually had him on my radio show and I did a radio show in Wilmington. And he was so good, Jacob, mm -hmm. so unique that we had a commercial break and held him over for another segment. The only other guy I ever did, did that with two other people, Chuck Abato, nice. when he was the NC State football coach because he was a character. Yeah. And I did it with Phil Ford time because, I mean, who, who doesn't want to sit there and listen to Phil Ford tell stories for 45 minutes? So Mike Voigt was the other one. Really, really interesting guy. Left us way too early, unfortunately. But I'm glad that we have an opportunity to do a series like this because it keeps his memory alive and educates some younger fans just about how fantastic some of these players were in Carolina football history that they may not know much about, you included. Mm -hmm. I'm sure you asked your dad about Mike Voigt, and anybody that saw Carolina back in those days will rave about Mike Voigt. He might be number 11 on this, this list, man, but I think he's got to be number one on the nickname list. I mean, Choo Choo is a great one, too, but, you know, the Space Cow, I don't, I don't know if it gets any better than that. that. That's a heck of a nickname right there. I would think that if you were to ask Carolina football fans in the 70s and 80s, like, who their favorite Tar Heels were, one of those guys. Mike Foyt would get a lot of votes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and not surprising when you just read up on how good he was and kind of talk about the personality behind it, because obviously that can play a big factor. And when you're growing up in that time watching somebody like that, those are guys that stick with you. Like you mentioned, those are guys you don't forget. You know what I mean? Those are guys that that'll live in your memory for a long time. So yeah. A really cool story about you having on a radio show too. That, that's awesome. Sounds like a, a great guy. Like you said, definitely gone way. Still too have that cassette. I yeah, may go, nice. we're in the off season now. So one of these days I got to go to storage, but I've got a lot of these interviews still. Yeah, I'd love I may to see transfer it. The Phil Ford one was fantastic, mm -hmm. uh, but the Mike Boyd one was pretty cool too. And I believe one of his buddies even called up. I have to remember, it was like 2001. I believe one of his buddies called up during the show and they were talking for a while. That's if awesome. I could find that and transfer it, I'd love to pop that on the board one day. I think people would really enjoy it. Yeah, that, that would be awesome. I would love to hear that as well. So moving on to the next guy, AJ, number 10 on this list, Dre Bly. I don't think he really needs an introduction. Cornerback play from 96 to 98 is obviously uh, a assistant coach for the Tar Heels right now. Two-time consensus All-American, three-time first team. All-American, only ACC player ever to do that, ACC Rookie of the Year in 96. And like I said, you're going to start hearing this a lot more with the rest of the guys on the on this list, named to the 50-year, 50, 50 greatest ACC players, players ever team and also a college football Hall of Famer. I was talking to you about him off camera. Uh, keep this in mind. I was born in 95, so, you know, Dre Bob was three years old when I left. Seen a ton of highlights of Dre, not, including in the NFL and in college. Um, know a lot about him, read on up a lot about him. I've obviously met him and, and talked to him a little bit at covering the team as well. Great personality, great character, a legend in, in Virginia Beach and in, in that area. And I think that's one of the reasons Carolina is doing so good at recruiting in that area over the past couple of seasons, especially. But man, 
it even shocked me, which I told you off camera, that I knew he was great. But when you look at those accolades, and then you, we're not talking about NFL on here, you can go look at those too. He's fantastic there. But when you just look at his college accolades, man, I was like, man, I, didn't, I don't think I knew he was quite that good when you actually sit here and have it all in front of you. But, I mean, one of the best cornerbacks to ever do it, not only in the ACC, but in college football. As good a freshman on defense as you'll ever find in college football. Mm -hmm. He was unbelievable. Mm -hmm. The first game I ever covered as a, as a credentialed member of the media of any kind – We've talked about it before. It was that 96 game when Carolina went to Virginia. Tar Heels were number six in the country. Mm -hmm. They were playing for, at the time, what was called an Alliance Bowl bid. A year later became the BCS. The BCS eventually sort of became the playoff. Uh, that day, Dre Bly picked off a pass and ran it back for a touchdown in only the fashion that he could, dancing to the end zone, a little showboat. Nothing wrong with that. Put Carolina up 17-3, to, th to three, and they ended up losing the game. Uh, it was the most devastating football loss, I think, in Carolina history. Uh, but I will never forget seeing him come from out of nowhere and pick that ball off. And he had 40 yards of daylight to just do the Dre Bly thing on his way into the end zone. And sitting up in the press box at Charlottesville and watching that, I was like, man, I got uh, already in person. He's just different. Yeah, he's a real deal. I'd yeah. seen a lot of college football in person up to that point. I've obviously seen a ton since then. And of all the plays that I've seen in my career, and that was the first game I ever covered, that one still stands out among, uh, among all the others, uh, among maybe the 10 or 15 plays that just pop, and I'll never forget every element of that sequence because it was almost breathtaking because of the way he was. That was classic Trey Block. He was so good. I think he had 22 career interceptions. He set a record as a freshman for most interceptions in the season. I had a couple in the bowl game, in their bowl game win. Those were great Carolina defenses in 96 and 97. Um, I, you could sit here and just check every box, of what you want from a college college corner. And really, it's a good pro. Played a couple of pro bowls, played a couple of Super Bowls. That's a long time, made a lot of cash. I mean, he backed it up in the NFL too. But as a college corner, he was as good as they, as they come. We talked about Moxie, like with yeah. Josh Downs, and, and you know we were talking about Ra Ra. We did a video about Ra Ra Dilworth, that Moxie he's got, and Dre Bly wrote the book on that stuff. Yeah, hundred percent. And and it's interesting because if guys go out on the field today and they got Moxie. Well, there's one guy that's on that field coaching them, who literally like uh, uh, personified yeah. Moxie, and they can work their tails off to try to reach his level. It'd be very very hard. I can't say enough about Dre. Mm -hmm. amazing player an absolutely breathtaking college football player and that's what you're going to get when you get in the top 10 in a program that has some pretty good history I think that people are starting to rediscover mm -hmm. 100 percent, yeah Dre's one of the greatest to ever do it you know especially on the defensive side and in college football history and obviously we're not talking about NFL in here but also had a really good NFL career won a Super Bowl so I mean yeah, you talk about Moxie. I'm glad you mentioned that because that was what I was going to say. A guy that really just epitomizes that. And just watch watch highlights for 30 seconds and you'll see it. It's hard to miss. So, yeah, Dre Bly, definitely one of the greatest to do it. And I think de definitely deserves to, to be in the top ten here. Um, moving on to, to number nine, Andy Bershak played in 1935 to 1937. So, another guy back in the 30s. Consensus All-American in 32nd. Seven, excuse me. Second team All-American in 36, two-time first team All-Southern Conference, 1938 Patterson medal winner, and his jersey number 59 is retired by the university. So, I mean, I mean, there's one thing that it takes. If you have a jersey retired at Carolina, I mean, you got to be one of the greatest to ever play there. That's not something they just do on a regular basis. But obviously a guy that you're not going to be able to find – a, t you won't be able to find any highlights on if you do good luck and definitely send that my way. But when you look at a guy like that, accolades playing back in the 30s for his air and what he was playing in one, one of the greatest to ever do it at Carolina yeah and, and you know I, I talk a lot about how the program's history is better than a lot of people think like it's not Kansas it's not Indiana or Kentucky it's it's mm -hmm. when people try to lump these basketball schools and all having the same kind of football program I mean Carolina had some rough patches obviously the, the, the 50s and 60s mostly were pretty bad uh, there had been large, long stretches in the 2000s where they really, really struggled. Mm -hmm. But there is a pretty solid history here. Uh, but when you have a program that has been up and down like North Carolina is over time, you know, it has some really nice stretches and then it kind of drops down. You have to highlight the really nice stretches. 
And when you think about Andy Bershock's era, 23, four and one, that's a really, really good. <clears throat> that was pre choo choo, which was the best era in program history. One that they might be on the brink of competing with here in the next several years. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, how important, how good were the teams these guys played on? How important were those eras when you look back historically in Carolina football? So just like with Paul Severin, you have to, you have to embrace from 1888 to now when they first started playing the sport and pull out the best elements of it. And a guy like him, he was phenomenal. He was all American and they were really, really good teams. And like you said, when you retire someone's number, that means something. Yeah. And that, and, and you know, Every once in a while, someone might get their number retired, you know, because of a tragedy or something like that. His was retired strictly because he was a stud on the football field. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the people who know Carolina history, the lead paces of the world will be able to rattle off all kinds of things about Andy Bershak because they know the program's history. They understand his importance to the full scope of the program's history. And that's why he's at number nine on this list. Exactly. Yeah. And I you know, like I said, it, it's hard to – I think it's harder for people nowadays to – some people will kind of argue that because you can't go pull up, you know, 20-minute highlight videos of them on YouTube and see, you know, every great thing they ever did. But when you actually sit down and kind of research these guys and realize how good they were for their era, they also laid down the foundations for the rest mm -hmm. of the program and helped get it to where it was, like you said, pre-Choo-Choo Justice era. Um, and, and obviously he's a, at, at the top of this list, which we'll get to in the next video. But. And Jacob, North Carolina is not retiring jerseys every year. No, that doesn't happen. So you get often. your jersey retired, there's a criteria, mm -hmm. and he met that criteria. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, he belongs on the list. 100%. And he belongs very high on the list. Yep, 100%. No, no, no arguments for me on why he's in the top 10. Now, last guy on this in this episode, we're going to cover number eight, Kelvin Bryant, another running back who played in the late 70s and, and early 80s, as you'll see, 1979 to 1982, three-time first team, all ACC, named to the 50-year, 50, 50 greatest ACC players ever team, and his 3,267 career rushing yards are fifth all-time at Carolina. I mean – I know who Kelly, I even I know who Kelvin Bryant is way before my time, obviously, but I've heard, I know that name. I know what he's done at Carolina, I know how good he was. And, and no, no surprises that he's another guy that's included in the top 10 here. 1981, he, I don't know what kind of running play it was, but it, I think he went around right in or something like that and he ran for about 15, 20 yards. Georgia Tech hurt his knee up to that carry. He was the absolute early front runner for the Heisman Trophy. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, he had six touchdowns in the opener, five in the second game, four in the third game, the most touchdowns scored ever in the history of college football in the first three games of the season. Uh, that team was primed, if he stayed healthy, to position themselves to play for a national championship. It ended up being Clemson. They lost to Clemson, I believe, in the game that Bryant came back, only 10 to 8. He, he missed several games and wasn't 100% late. So his numbers are skewed. If he stayed healthy, he'd be higher up there in the ranking and all those rankings lists as far as uh, uh, total career rushing yards and all that stuff. And, you know, we're going to hear the word high, we're going to hear the words Heisman Trophy thrown around a lot as we get closer to this coming season because Sam's going to be one of the front runners. Well, the last guy to really really make a push for it North Carolina early on, albeit was uh, Kelvin Bryant. He was the last one that people looked at North Carolina and said that, you know, that guy could be the one who wins this award. That was 40 years ago. I know, it's, hard, wild, yeah. I mean, it's blown me away. It's hard to believe that was 40 years ago. He was awesome. He could catch the ball. He could run between tackles. He could run wide. Uh, he had a nice NFL career. I think he won a Super Bowl with the Redskins. Of course, that doesn't factor into this, but he was so, so good. He could do so many things. And he also shared time. We've talked in the previous video that we did about some of the great running backs of Carolina history. You know, Javante Williams and Michael Carter weren't the first duo to each run for a thousand yards in the same season. There's a history of that at North Carolina. It happened in the seventies. It happened in the eighties. It happened with Johnson and Johnson, I believe in 1993, Calvin Bryant was sharing time with Amos Lawrence and with Ethan Horton and all these, and, and, and you know, Carolina football in the running back position on the offensive line back in that period was outstanding. Mm -hmm. It was really, really good. And and Kelvin Bryant, you could argue, was – I wouldn't say he's the best of those running backs. That guy's still on this list. 
ahead of us here, but uh, he's one of the best. And certainly if you consider running the ball, catching the ball and multiplicity, he might even be the best of all those, of all those guys. Yeah. I mean, it's just, you, once you kind of look at this list it's from 25 to, to the first, first guy on here, I mean, it's, you can make, you can make a very strong argument that Carolina might be running back you, or at least is in the top five. Cause they just had some, there fun. was a time where they were called that. Yeah. Back then there was a time they were called that they had the most thousand yard rushers mm-hmm. uh, of any program in history. Um, you know, like uh, Penn State or Southern Cal or other schools that were in contention for that. But there was a time where they could build themselves as running back you. Yeah. And you look at what they've done in recent years, like you said, with Javante and Michael, if things like that keep up, they might slide back into the argument. I think anybody could definitely make a case for them being in the top 10 or top five when it comes to that, no doubt, because they just had some phenomenal running backs, like you said, especially, you know, in, in the period back 70s, 80s, that, that kind of period as well. So and going back, which we'll talk about in the next video, when we kind of when we break down number seven through number one on our list. So make sure you guys tune into that when that one comes out. But as always, guys, I think it's a good place to wrap it up. I've been Jacob Turner. He's been Andrew Jones. Um, If you've enjoyed this series so far, go ahead and watch the other ones, obviously, and go ahead and give this video a thumbs up as well. I know I've really enjoyed recording it, and I've learned a lot just doing this for series and also editing and, you know, looking up pictures, looking up stats. I mean, it's been a really fun one, I know, personally for me. And I know AJ's really enjoyed not only putting these together, but also talking about them on here as well. So make sure you guys go check out the ones we have done and stay tuned for number seven through number one. You know, you guys know the drill, though. Like, share, subscribe to our channel. See you in the next one. Thanks. Thanks.